I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times, and welcome to The New York Times Close Up, a program on which we feature leading newsmakers and The New York Times journalists who cover them. This week, a primer on the New York City budget. We'll take a look at how the process works, what it reveals about the priorities of the mayor and the city council, and most importantly, how or if local government is being held accountable to the taxpayers. Here to discuss fiscal transparency, government integrity, and oversight, Louisa Chaffee, the new director of the Independent Budget Office. You've been in the office since February. You're the first new director in about 25 years. Ronnie Lowenstein was the last one, uh, almost the founding director. And uh, what have you learned since February? What, have, what surprised you about the city's finances, the city's budget? You had been in city government before. What did you learn that you didn't expect about New York City finances? Well, first of all, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, may we all live in interesting times. I think we can agree that the rapidly changing news cycle and the rapidly evolving city fiscal position has been enormously interesting the last seven months. Obviously, we've had the increase in asylum seekers and the fiscal and operational costs of arrivals. We've also had uh, the end or the close to the end of the COVID funding shifting the city's budget perspective. And also the city has rightfully come to agreements with most of the unions. So the last couple months have brought a lot of change and it's been a rapidly evolving situation and uh, very interesting to be closely studying. When you renovate a house, a contractor discovers all sorts of things that he and a homeowner never discovered before, things in the walls, things in the stairs. What have you discovered in the city budget that you didn't know was there? Uh, were there things that don't belong there? Were there things that you felt we weren't spending enough on? Were there things that you felt we could no longer afford? I know the IBO, the Independent Budget Office, is a nonpartisan office. It's what it should be. It is called independent. Uh, it makes a uh, few recommendations. It, proposes options rather than says what we should do. But did you discover things that you just didn't know existed, whether they were potential problems or solutions or challenges? Um, so the independent budget is, uh, the independent budget office is nonpartisan and independent. So we do not take political positions. That said, there are many details in many parts of the city budget that are illuminating. And when one combines the understanding of the money and the policy, one really um, learns much more. And I personally have learned a great deal about the Department of Education since coming to the IBO. We have a dedicated team that studies the Department of Education and works closely with them. And the department is in a rapidly evolving uh, position with new leadership through the new, but relatively new Adams administration. So we've been looking at some of the unexpected expenditures in the Department of Education, and particularly we've been looking at how children with special needs diagnosis uh, that fall into the category of having to appeal to not be taught at the Department of Education, but rather have city dollars pay for their education in other places because their learning needs are such that the city can't address them. There, that's a very rapidly changing situation with huge amounts of monies being unexpectedly spent. And as an agency, we've really learned a great deal. We don't have a position as to the pros and the cons, but we're best de definitely looking and learning with education as they navigate this cohort that is referred to in government as Carter cases. Are they being referred too often to those outside uh, learning opportunities or not often enough? Or are we paying too much? Or we what, do you, what do you suggest? We are agnostic on the diagnosis. We believe that you know, the children are rightfully diagnosed. Our question is really the operations between once a child is diagnosed as not being able to be served in its school and being moved to the new school. The current process can take up to two years with families needing to sue the Department of Education, going through a legal process, and it's almost always approved. So we're really just looking at how the money flows through the operations, 
This is one example, Sam, but it's certainly an area I've learned about. It's an area we know DOE is really focusing on shifting. And it's, you know, we all recognize it's really important for children that they have the appropriate learning environment so that each child may thrive. Now, you've also found that teacher retention is a problem, particularly since the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and this is a growing problem because the new state standards coming in about class size and obviously there are migrants entering the uh, school system uh, who create a double challenge because many of them don't speak English. Yes, so we have studied um, English language learners, many of whom are recent arrivees, not just the asylum seekers. We're a city of immigrants. We have hundreds of languages spoken in our school system and not necessarily taught. And we've been definitely looking at the teacher retention and trying to understand how COVID impacted the regular movement of teachers in and out of the system. and. Um, how DOE will shift their teacher recruitment because the new classroom size law, as you referenced, um, requires a great, uh, requires elements of great increase, both in teachers and in classrooms. And so this may require the Department of Education to build many more classrooms, depending on the nuances of population and how the law is implemented. It's a complicated Im implementation process um, with a fine spirit to help students learn by making sure there are plenty of teachers in the system. Why is teacher retention a problem? Uh, was that a result of COVID or is there something larger at work here? It appears that COVID and on a certain level escalated other situations. People work for many years and then move on. Some people move mid-career. And we also know that teaching caused um, great challenges and that there were certainly burnout and also rising to the you know opportunity and the challenge. So we don't have all the details as to what happened but we can see the movement through the system and we thought it was important to highlight uh, the differences that were occurring uh, in the last couple of years. One of the things the IBO has done uh, under you I believe is create a budget tool maybe a budget toy is more appropriate, that allows uh, people to see how much each agency spends a day, which makes the New York City budget a little more uh, accessible. Uh, education, I think, is the biggest expenditure, about $89 million a day. The Independent Budget Office, as far as I could tell, spends $13,000 a day, which I guess by any measure is a bargain. Uh, but are we spending too much on certain things? How do we measure uh, what we're getting for our buck? Uh, how do we measure uh, accountability in the budget? Uh, you know, what are we getting for that dollar? How do we measure productivity? How do we measure uh, the, the efficiency of the city? Not just how much we spend and, and you know, what we get back, how do we measure, you know, what comes from the amount of money we spend? Those are great questions. Um, I don't think we have even the beginning of enough time to answer those. And so we should, I should be clear that there are many different parts of government that lead to accountability. The IBO is a little part of that equation. We created this tool because we thought it would help New Yorkers to understand what does it cost to operate the city. In fact, IBO does reports because people come to us and bring us questions. And Councilman Justin Brennan asked us, what does it cost to operate the city for a day? And so we looked at various ways and decided the best way to answer that was, as we say, as you said, create a tool toy. Um, and it's on our website. Feel free to check it out. And it's a way of sorting and seeing what are the different costs using just one year's data, 2022, from the city's financial management system? So it's an imperfect toy. Accountability is a really complicated question with many different levels of insight. But we're committed to transparency, and we believe that the more the public knows and understands, the more people can ask and, and um, inquire and learn, teach themselves and help others understand, advocate for what they care about and get involved. And that's really central to our mission. It's pretty hard to promote transparency these days when people are bombarded with data, bombarded with numbers. 
Do people believe in numbers anymore? Do they believe in what we used to sort of take for granted as authenticity? Well, that's a philosophical question. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a philosopher, but we do believe that it helps people to understand uh, what's going on around them, the fiscal choices, the policy choices their city's making, if they have ways to see it more or see it in different ways. And so that's why IBO is shifting how we do reports. We've always had really deep, long reports, and we continue to be committed to that excellence that came before me. But we're also thinking of new ways to reach our audience. As you referenced the budget tool, we also this year thought it would be very helpful if people could understand their local school's budget. So we created a video explainer, uh, teaching people, if they want to learn, how to navigate the city's budget documents and find out in each school what the budget is. It's a way to do it yourself and to understand what's going on. And uh, we also thought by doing it in video, it's a different tactic. We're interested to see if it works for people and we're happy to continue if we find it to be effective. One of the things you pointed out recently, uh, looking at uh, the budget a little more carefully perhaps, is that cultural institutions in the city are actually getting a bit more than we expected they were getting when you look at, when you break down what they're getting in terms of uh, not just direct cultural grants, but uh, purchases and things from other city agencies. Yes, um, how the city funds- Not enough, but more. Yes, how the city funds arts organizations is a fascinating example of how the city budget works. So the Department of Cultural Affairs directly funds cultural organizations. But there are many places that arts organizations engage New Yorkers through city dollars, through other agencies. And so we highlighted some $90 million of spend to nonprofits through agencies apart from cultural affairs. So to do this, we looked very carefully at the city's procurement system and looked in effect in a, in a function of government that is wholly illogical if one were looking for how um, arts grants are created. But because of the access IBO has to data and the skill sets of the staff, we figured out all these additional funding streams and we think it really helps to understand the types of organizations, the location, the types of services, help New Yorkers think about how their government is creating arts vibrant and alive in New York City. And how do we uh, support arts organizations through procurement? What are some examples of that? So for example, if there's a theater program in a public school that might be provided by a nonprofit uh, doing services. Um, they're complicated, but there's something called a pass-through. Mm -hmm. So one agency might procure for another agency their services that um, support uh, filmmakers, women filmmaking, telling stories that flow through various different city agencies and are helping tell that important story. So they're somewhat more unique than straight up cultural uh, funding. But it's also an important way for artists and agencies and cultural affairs and us as a city to think about how we're funding the system. There are a couple of big issues that we're facing now, some of which you mentioned earlier, uh, that loom on the horizon as potential challenges to the city. One obviously is the uh, vacancy rate in office space. Do we have any sense as to how that is going to affect the budget in this year and coming years in terms of property tax revenue and other sources of income? So we're looking really carefully and we're data driven and this is an enormously complex issue because there is such a variety in commercial space usage. Not everyone's lease starts and ends at the same time and there are a huge variety in types of property. All of which adds up to yes, there will be some level of impact but we're not yet ready to fully articulate, nor are we sure that we can yet articulate what, sh what the shifts may be. And is the biggest impact in terms of property tax revenue, or is there some other impact that we don't really know about? And is there any potential advantage to this? 
Right. Well, I think we have to remember that New York has reinvented itself through many potential crises. If we just think back to what Soho was in the 70s, a relatively deserted neighborhood of warehouses and small businesses that had left, where those who were looking for large spaces moved in and it became an artist community and has shifted again and again to a totally different type of neighborhood. In other words, a, a reinvention. Mm -hmm. We have now in New York a situation where there are many properties that aren't being used in the commercial way they were intended and might be able to address the housing crisis that New York is concurrently facing. That will require legislative changes. Each building is different. There are construction issues. But the reality is that we have the makings of a potential for reinvention, and we believe in the energy of this city to harness that and move forward. Congestion pricing, another big unknown, uh, something that it, it's not held up in court or in other ways likely to begin sometime next year. What's the impact of that going to be? Is it going to keep people out of the city? Is it going to generate revenue for mass transit? Uh, is it anybody's guess? Well, we're looking and we're interested. You know, were there many other cities that we can look to, for examples, where there were changes in congestion pricing, lessening traffic, increasing envir positive environmental impact. Um, and we're certainly studying it. New York is particularly complicated because of the way traffic flows um, and because of the rapidly shifting uh, need for movement in and out of the area impacted. But stay tuned, we'll be reporting on it. Okay, can you give us any hint? Not yet. Uh, is it gonna be a plus or a minus overall, do you think? Well, Sam, I think that depends what chair you sit in. We're a nonpartisan independent agency. Well, so. in terms of revenue uh, options, is it gonna be a plus or a minus? Obviously, it's gonna generate revenue, we assume, for mass transit. Uh, is there gonna be any potential loss in revenue uh, from economic activity or anything else? Well, that's exactly the trade-off. The question is by forcing people or by Preventing, presenting fiscal incentives to not use one's personal vehicles, may or vehicles, will people make the choice to in fact not engage with geographic areas of the city? Will there be fiscal impacts on organizations because of it that are discernible and attributable directly to congestion pricing? And that's a central challenge, um, but we can look at particularly our European example cities that have, um, in fact, thrived, where people have found other ways to engage. It depends if you're uh, running a business and trying to get supplies in versus an individual driving in mm -hmm. um, and, you know, re-exploring the subway. So there are lots of trade-offs. So it might be good for parking garages north of 60th Street, good for restaurants that are easier supplied, bad for restaurants that get fewer patrons. Is, is that sort of what the balance is? I mean, those, those are the types of trade-offs that are being explored and considered. Migrants uh, coming into the city, migrants or refugees or however we want to describe them, pluses or minuses at this point for the city economic activity. The, obviously, there is a cost, there is a burden, there has always been a plus to the city overall, I think, if I'm right, from immigration, historically. Yes, so in, uh, New York City is a city of immigrants and has historically thrived through waves of immigrants. This current wave of asylum seekers is large um, and the city having navigated it from, for over a year is pivoting from the emergency to more standard operations and how the city serves fiscally immigrants. Choices about working are not the city's choices, but we recognize that the federal government has now made a policy shift, and uh, we believe that this will also start a different um, revenue stream. Uh, and we believe that um, it's important to recognize that we are a city of immigrants. Consent decrees, again, you are nonpartisan, you are independent, but is the city, with all the best intentions, saddled with too many of these in terms of providing shelter, uh, jail population, and uh, the decrees that it has agreed to in terms of 
uh, detention and things like that? Uh, can it afford those things, however well-intentioned they may have been? You're, you're not answering that question, I we can have say. A, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, Sam, I worked for ACS and I worked in uh, leading the sheltering system for many years, so I'm deeply familiar with consent decrees. Um, they're put in place often because other situations have failed and right. the court becomes involved. And they're put in place to keep the system functioning. New York City has a $107 billion budget. We are of the largest econ local uh, cities in the country. We are um, capable of addressing huge crises. Consent decrees involve other parts in administration beyond the recognized mayoralty and city council. And there may be trade-offs in that, uh, but so far New York has navigated every consent decree that has occurred. Uh, navigated is sort of a, you know, amorphous word in this case. We've navigated uh, and wound up on the shoals in, in many cases. Uh, can we afford them anymore? Uh, the mayor is trying to uh, navigate away from them, certainly in terms of uh, the migrant crisis, certainly in terms of homeless shelter. Uh, have we gone overboard, if you will, uh, to continue the metaphor uh, in being too generous? Uh, can we afford that anymore? Uh, I wrote an article recently for the Times looking back at the 1975 fiscal crisis and uh, after that uh, Felix Rowenton said that uh, even if New York survived it would be a lesser place than it had been before. Can New York afford to be the generous place that it has been in recent decades? <laughs> So we're nonpartisan yes. and independent. But what I can tell you is that the current wave of asylum seekers added to the existing communities of homeless seekers are being cared for by the city. And they are figuring out how to provide the appropriate legally required services and how to provide additional services so as to assist as people transition through the system. It's our job to look not at whether or not we philosophically agree with is this right or wrong, but fiscally is it working. For the current year, the city has the budget in place to serve this very large community in the, in the currently established ways. And the city is moving towards a uh, normalization of these services, which will also make the dollars that they are spending more efficient. The city is receiving help from the state, as is appropriate, and the feds are increasingly supporting the city in this particular slice of the budget. A very quick philosophical question. Do you get frustrated that you put out all these options which seem reasonable and sometimes nobody listens? Well, our, so once a year we create a publication called Budget Options, mm -hmm. which are basically an opportunity for people at IBO who have ideas about how to do things differently to suggest ideas. Some of them are ideas that are adopted, such as legalizing marijuana. And some of them are wild ideas that we enjoy thinking through and don't really make sense for prime time. But the, uh, what we learn by studying the system is also sometimes opportunities for change. New York right now is back into a cycle of budget cuts, the pegs as they're called. And so we know that our city agencies are looking at our budget options and we're working on new budget options to think about how to help the city improve efficiency or decrease costs and keep this city strong so that New Yorkers continue to thrive here. Thank you for joining us, Louisa Chaffee, the new head of the Independent Budget Office. And coming up, I'll have some thoughts on dressing up and personal ties. When I attended PS219 in Brooklyn, we were required to wear a white shirt and red tie once a week when we gathered in the auditorium for assembly. We also started the school day pledging allegiance to the flag, reminding the rest of the world that, unlike pagan communists, we were one nation under God. 
We marched into assembly to a stirring tune titled The Happy Wanderer. The original lyrics were in German, an irony lost on us just a few years after World War II. The title, too, was ironic. In the early 1950s, the farthest most Americans were wandering was to the suburbs. It was the era of the organization man, of the man in the gray flannel suit, of uniforms and conformity. I hated having to wear that white shirt and tie, but I understood that it was intended as a gesture of respect, not necessarily to fellow students or even the teachers who you saw every day, or even to our principal who hovered as an authority figure but anomalously wore a belt with a flashy cowboy buckle. We wore ties out of respect for the institution, the school, the community that supported it, the education it promised as a path to whatever we thought the American dream might turn out to be. If between ducking under our desks in air raid drills, memorizing historical dates and names we would never need to remember, and incurring slights and making friendships we would never forget, we thought about the American dream at all. In a way, that's why I'm wearing a tie now, out of respect for you, the viewers, and for the people I interview. Call me old fashioned, but I bristled when John Fetterman, speaking louder than some of Chuck Schumer's sports jackets, wore shorts and a hoodie in the Senate. Give him some credit. He succeeded in vexing his Republican colleagues, who took the bait in this latest version of the emperor's new clothes. In politics, your neck used to be something you occasionally stuck out to defend a point of principle. Ties bound you to a common goal called governing, not just getting reelected. What senators wear to work is just one sign of self-regard and mutual respect. But what too many politicians don't seem to be worrying about these days is that it's not just what you wear, it's what's underneath. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.